Hi there, I'm Jake. I make cartoons explaining mythology, and sometimes people write comments telling me I did it wrong. Now, to be clear, while I would consider my cartoons to be edutainment, they're definitely more tainment than edu, if that makes sense. So in service of making my videos funny and easily digestible, I'll gloss over certain things, I'll change details in order to make a funnier joke, and sometimes, on a rare occasion, like Haley's Comet passing the Earth every 75 years, I'll make a mistake. So I wanted to make this video where I'll go over my first few Greek mythology videos and address some of the comments I've gotten about historical accuracy, which isn't as straightforward as a lot of you assume, and also go into more detail about some of the things that I feel deserve better elaboration. And yeah, I know there is no correct version of any mythology, but there is a difference between stories written as fiction and stories that were told as part of a religious tradition, and I try to base my videos mainly on the latter. By the way, you should probably first watch all of my Greek mythology cartoons for context on the stuff that I'm about to talk about. I think they're pretty funny. Anyway, let's go. So right off the bat in my first video, I put up a pretty arbitrary and misleading range for when the Greek gods were worshipped. In reality, there's no clear starting point because Greek mythology is just a very broad umbrella term for the beliefs of a lot of different Mediterranean groups over several centuries. I put in 700 BC during Archaic Greece because that's when Hesiod wrote the Theogony, which was my main source for that video. And then I marked the end of the worship of the Greek gods at 800 AD because that's around when paganism was pretty much wiped out in Greece. But then again, relatively recently, there's been a rise in neo-pagan revival movements like Hellenism. So really, the the Greek gods are being worshipped today, they were just on hiatus for a thousand years or so. Moving on, one god people have gotten on my case for ignoring is the first primordial god, Chaos. And for the record, I did include a reference to them in my video, so shut up. Now, in the ancient Greek language, chaos doesn't hold the same meaning that it does in English. It refers simply to an infinite void from which the other gods arose. Chaos's direct children are Erebos, the personification of darkness, but not like darkness with an evil connotation, just literal darkness, and also Nyx, the personification of night. Oh, and I also skipped Pontus, who's one of Gaia's children and is the literal entire ocean, so I guess he's important too. Moving on to the second generation of gods, a lot of people seem to have a misunderstanding of what the word Titan means. Like, people will say Cronus wasn't a god, he was a Titan, which is like saying, I'm not an American, I'm a Wisconsinite. Titan was a title given by your Uranus. Yes, I choose to pronounce it like that. To the five sons of him who work together to castrate him, and it roughly translates to straining gods. Sick burn, Uranus. The title then became generalized to refer to just all 12 of Uranus's godly children, and then even further generalized to just most of their descendants who were in power before their war with the Olympians. Oh, and speaking of the Titan War, there's one detail on that I wanted to touch on. In the aftermath of the war, I depicted Cronus having been chopped up into a bunch of pieces by Zeus. This is a popular detail in a lot of modern retellings, but I only learned after making the video that it doesn't seem to be present in any ancient Greek sources. I'm not actually sure where it came from, but it ain't Greek, so that's a big goof on my part. Now, all of Cronus and Rhea's children were very important gods, but the one that I definitely did dirty in my video was Hestia. Hestia was a major goddess associated with maintaining a safe and comfortable household, so she'd have been a big deal to pretty much everyone. However, because her role was less grandiose, she doesn't appear in many myths, and that's kind of what I was trying to poke fun at. The main object associated with her was the hearth, which makes sense because that's what keeps your house warm and what you use to cook food. I turned this into campfires, which was really dumb of me. I guess I was just trying to make it funnier, but it was really just misleading and dumb, so sorry. Another goddess I snubbed was Metis, the mother of Athena, who I only mention offhandedly, which is really unfair because she's cool. Metis was actually the first wife of Zeus, and she played a huge role in the Titanomachy as his advisor, and she was actually the one who came up with the idea to trick Cronus into puking up his kids. Afterward, Zeus received a prophecy that should he have a son by Metis, that son would usurp him. So instead of, you know, just not having sex with her, he tricks her into turning into a fly and eats her. But Metis was already knocked up and gave birth to Athena, who then popped out of Zeus's head. And since women don't get to inherit from their fathers in ancient Greece, she was no threat to him, so it was all cool. And it seems like Metis, having been absorbed by Zeus, was considered by some to be the source of his wisdom. But don't let that make you think Greek mythology was all about girl power, because now we're going to talk about about my boy Hesiod and his issues. By the way, fair warning, if any of these subjects make you uncomfortable, then you may want to stop the video here because they're a main element in my next few points. Now, ancient Greece was a horrifically patriarchal society. Women were treated essentially as property and had very little personal autonomy. But even for someone living in such a society, Hesiod seemed to have a weirdly passionate resentment for women. 
as a concept. From her is descended the female sex, a great affliction to mortals as they dwell with their husbands, no fit partners for a cursed poverty, but only for plenty, as the bees in their sheltered nest feed the drones, those conspirators in badness, and will they busy themselves all day and every day till sundown making the white honeycomb, the drones stay inside in their sheltered cells and pile the toils of others into their own bellies. And even so, as a bane of mortal men has high thundering Zeus created women, conspirators in causing difficulty. Bro, I'm sorry she dumped you, but this isn't healthy. You need to move on. And so he interprets Zeus creating women as a punishment on mankind for their disobedience. And I included this detail in my video to help illustrate just how awful it was in ancient Greece for anyone with the audacity to have a vagina. Another story that captures ancient Greeks' patriarchal culture is that of Hades and Persephone. But I got a lot of people telling me that in the original story, Persephone actually elopes with Hades, and her mom was just being a big Karen. And that is wrong. It's just wrong. Now, Persephone is a very old goddess, possibly even older than Hades, dating back all the way to Mycenaean Greece. However, our information on her from that period is very sparse and brief, maybe because people didn't like talking about spooky death gods. So exactly how she was viewed and the mythology surrounding her then is largely up to speculation. We really can't say much about it definitively. But by Archaic Greece, we got the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, which is our most comprehensive telling of her and Hades' story. And there's not really much room for interpretation regarding the nature of their engagement. She's forcibly taken against her will, she's miserable right up until Hades lets her go back up to see her mom, and he has to trick her into eating the pomegranate seeds to make her stay. The story reflects the tragic reality that women in ancient Greece didn't get to choose who they married. It was an agreement, or really more like a transaction, between the families of the bride and groom. I'd like to believe that any half-decent father would try to set their daughter up with someone she actually likes, but there were also probably many, many situations like Persephone's. The really dark thing about Greek mythology is that when you hear about a woman getting married or having sex with a man, it can be a little vague whether or not she's a consenting party. Because to a lot of writers at the time, that wasn't a very important detail. And since we're on the subject of women who were treated awfully, this last one is by far the thing I've gotten the most comments about, and that's me getting Medusa's backstory wrong. Which I did, because I sort of combined two different versions, but a lot of people pointing this out seem to have misguided notions about Medusa as a figure. This is going to take a while to explain, because Medusa is a very complicated figure due to how much she's evolved over the centuries, so please bear with me. Gorgon-like imagery goes back thousands of years, but by Archaic Greece it had somewhat solidified to this. A scary lady with wings and snakes for hair and a big, ugly, grimacing face, often with a beard. I did not include that last detail in my video. The face of Medusa is an extremely common symbol in Greek architecture and day-to-day -day items, likely used as a sort of protective symbol to ward off danger, kind of like a gargoyle. As we move towards classical Greece, where artists got a big hard-on for the ideal physical form, we start to see Medusa depicted as a more or less regular looking woman, give or take wings or snake hair. While this could point to a change in how she was perceived in their culture, I'm leaning more towards artists coming down with a case of female orc syndrome. As for her and Poseidon, Hesiod does briefly mention them having sex, and he actually makes it sound like it was a mutually consensual, even romantic affair. But this is Hesiod we're talking about, so we can never be 100% sure. Remember what I said about female consent often being ambiguous. And then fast forward a few centuries and enter Ovid. Ovid is one of the most popularly cited writers in all of Greek mythology. The problem is, he wasn't Greek. He was Roman. And despite what some people may have told you, I'm looking at you, Ricky, the Roman religion is not just a rebranding of the Greek religion. This is a complicated subject, and I have to do a lot more research on it before I can go and make a video about it, but suffice to say, they're distinctly different traditions with some shared DNA. And while Romans were big fans of Greek myths, they viewed them through their own cultural lens, so their interpretations of these stories do not reflect ancient Greek beliefs and values. Another thing is that unlike, say, Hesiod, who took his work very seriously as a devout Zeus follower, Ovid wrote his stories as fiction. I don't like equating mythology to fanfic, as a lot of people do on the internet, but Ovid was basically writing fanfic. And so his stories very much reflect his own personal values and have a strong anti-authority sentiment. 
This may or may not have contributed to his banishment from Rome later in life. In accordance with his worldview, Ovid had a tendency to depict gods as behaving petty and unfair towards mortals. He wasn't the first writer to take this kind of critical approach to the Greek gods, but he's by far the most popular one to have done it. And he's heavily influenced how we today view Greek mythology, despite, like I said, not being Greek. So anyway, in Ovid's Metamorphosis, he tells the story of Medusa originally being a beautiful human woman, her being raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple, and Athena punishing her for it by turning her into the monster that we're all familiar with. Now, could Ovid have been retelling an authentic Greek myth that has since been lost? Sure, but there's no surviving evidence to support that, so I'm going to go with probably not. Now, fast forward some more into the 20th century, Medusa's story resonated strongly with members of the second wave feminist movement, and she once again became used as a protective symbol, now specifically for women. And I believe it was through this movement that we got a now very popular reinterpretation of Ovid's Medusa story, where Athena's curse was actually an act of mercy to protect her from male lust. This is a pretty cool interpretation, but it's very important to understand that there's no evidence of this being something the ancient Greeks would have believed. Anyway, in my video, I combined elements from the Greek tradition with Ovid's backstory. Yes, it's kind of cheating to use a non-Greek source for my Greek mythology video, but I thought it made the story more interesting. So I'm sorry for anyone who might have thought it was based entirely off of Greek tradition. And that's about it for now. I know there's plenty more stuff in my videos that I could touch on, but this took a while to put together, and so I just wanted to focus on the most interesting subjects. If you'd like to tear some of my points to shreds down in the comments, please do. I'm not trying to pretend I'm anywhere near an expert on this stuff. But if you're going to share information on Greek mythology, please, I'm begging you. Cite specific sources. Everything we know about Greek mythology is based on something somebody wrote down or surviving artifacts. And most of that information can be accessed for free on the internet. Theory.com is my go-to resource, as I've mentioned before. If someone makes a claim that they don't bother to back up with a source, you shouldn't consider them reliable, and parroting what they say can very easily spread misinformation. Anyway, if you like this video, please consider supporting my channel with all that stuff the algorithm likes. Bye!